Good day, beautiful people, and welcome back to Life Treasures and Golden Moments. This is Natalie Silva. I wanted to let you all know that today, or this month, is the 5th year anniversary of Life Treasures and Golden Moments. I started it in October of 2016 with the intention of sharing true stories of miracles and inspiration so I could help you lift the human spirit and to inspire and motivate positive action in your life journey. I hope I've done that. When I first started this podcast, I had a little sidekick, a little beautiful little puppy named Angel, and she was my little gal that sat on the back of my chair in the office as I recorded each story that was shared by authors. And she passed away the next year, but uh, she was one of my inspirations when I talk about animals. I do miss her. She filled my heart. And all of you that are animal lovers, you know what that feels like. So on occasion, you will hear some uh, stories on animals. And so today, in honor of my fifth anniversary and in tribute to Angel, I want to repeat the first story that I shared with you all in October of 2016. And it is a miracle that was uh, performed or shared by um, an animal uh, to a couple and it is called Paying It Forward, and the author is Holly Baxley. The other story that I want to share with you today is a story about miracles for everyday life. And that story is called Incredible, and it was authored by David Jeremiah. And I looked up uh, the history of the story, and I think you'll find it very fascinating. I was pulled into listening to it and reading it because um, originally I'm from the area that this happened in, and I was on the highway that this had happened on. And I think you will find this most interesting. So there's miracles out there every day if we just look around and have our mind and our eyes open to them. So I think I'm going to start off today with the miracles for everyday life. And you know, everyday miracles, it sounds like an oxymoron. But most of us think of miracles as big things. They usually seem to be in t- attention getting, or uh, we're awed by them, by the event. So to lump them together, it seems kind of ridiculous, really. Yet, you know, there's small miracles and big miracles. Yet, the question presents itself Does God perform miracles? in the ordinary experiences of life? If the answer is yes, and it probably is, sometimes we risk losing sight of the fact that miracles are special, unexplainable, and, well, miraculous. Yet if we stretch our thinking a little bit more, enough to include this new and broader picture, we may also come closer to accepting the possibility that God still performs miracles today. God's miracles are for everybody, not just certain people. They're not all performed for those we see as super saints. In God's eyes, every person has value beyond measure. In our world, every miracle does as well. This story is called Incredible. And as I said earlier, the author is David Jeremiah. And later on, if you want to find the history, uh, you can find a write-up. It was in May of 12, 1992, in the Boston Globe. It happened around noon on Mother's Day, according to a national news report. 27-year-old Michael Murray decided to take his two children to the medical center in Massachusetts, where the mother was on duty as a surgical nurse. The family wanted to drop off some Mother's Day presents, a gold necklace with the words, Number One Mom, and a single rose. Where the mission accomplished, the father and his two children made their way back to the darkened indoor garage where the car had been parked. Murray gently set the infant seat and the three-month-old Matthew on the sunroof of the car and turned his attention to buckling Matthew's 20-month-old sister into her car seat. Without thinking any further, Murray slid into the driver's seat and drove off, forgetting that Matthew was still on the roof. Moving slowly from the darkened garage in the bright sunlight, Murray drove through busy streets toward Interstate 290. 
Despite heavy traffic, nobody beeped or waved to warn him that anything was wrong. Pulling on to the expressway that cuts through the city, the driver accelerated to 50 miles per hour. And then he heard it. A scraping on the roof of his car as a tiny seat with Matthew strapped in began to slide. He said, I looked to where Matthew should have been, in the car, and then in the rearview mirror. I saw him sliding down the highway in his infant car seat. That's where he landed, in the middle of the interstate, in the path of an oncoming traffic. The car seat flew off the roof and hit the road and was sliding down the highway almost as fast as the cars were coming toward it. An antique dealer named James Boothbay was following the Murray car when he saw the whole event unfold. He saw young Matthew sail off the roof and hit the road. He said, I saw something in the air. At first I thought someone had thrown some garbage out the window. Then I saw it and thought it was a doll. Then the doll opened its mouth and I realized that it was a little baby. It just landed on the road. It bounced a couple of times and it never tipped over. It just landed on the road. It bounced a couple of times, and it never tipped over. It just landed on the road and slid along a bit. I slammed on my brakes and turned my car around in the lane so that no other cars could go by. I jumped from the car, and I ran and I found an uninjured baby in an undamaged car seat and scooped him up in my arms and took him back and gave him to his petrified father. This true story has to be as close to a great a miracle as anything you and I have ever experienced. God intervened in the situation, or it would have been an incredible tragedy. Now I'd like to share with you the true account of what happened, and you can look this up on the internet. Um, this was in the Chicago Tribune. Uh, and it was written by Chris Reedy of the Boston Globe on May 12th of 1992, Millbury, Mass. After his three-month-old son sailed off the roof of his car at 50 miles per hour and landed unhurt in the middle of an interstate highway on Sunday, Michael Murray decided to break the news to his wife gently. It was Mother's Day, and Murray, a 27-year-old factory worker, said he did not want to stay right out that he had messed up. But absent-mindedly driving off while his son was strapped into a car seat he had left on the sunroof of his 1987 Hyundai. As her husband sheepishly held Matthew, who was sleeping serenely in white pajamas and a sunbonnet, Deanna Murray, 28, recounted the phone call. Come to the emergency room, he told me. A surgical nurse, Deanna Murray, was on duty at the medical center of central Massachusetts when her husband's call came in. The emergency room is down the hall from her workstation. Just come down here. That's all he told me. Describing the phone call, Matthew has fallen. I ran all the way down the hall. After hearing the full story, Deanna Murray said, she was in shock. The nurses had to sit me down and hold me. It's a miracle, it really is. It's a good thing he didn't tell me on the phone. Every time I hear the story, I could burst into tears. Deanna Murray heard the story a lot Monday as the media descended on the Millbury farmhouse where she lives with her husband and two children. The Murrays obligingly went through the details over and over again. But Deanna Murray balked when a photographer requested that Michael reenact the sequence of events. You're not going to put him on that roof again, are you? Deanna Murray said, the only time she expressed a hint of displeasure with her husband. As Michael Murray recounted it, things began innocently enough around the noon on Sunday when he decided to drive Matthew and his 20-month-old sister to the hospital where Deanna was working the day shift. He wanted to drop off her Mother's Day gifts, a gold necklace bearing the legend Number One Mom and a single rose. After presenting these gifts, Murray carried his two children back to the indoor garage where he had parked. Murray had put his daughter in her car seat but got into the car 
with Matthew still on the sunroof. The garage was dark, Murray said, when asked how he could have forgotten about his son. Murray then proceeded to drive through the streets of Worcester. Traffic was heavy, he said, but no one beeped at him to indicate that anything was amiss. As he accelerated onto the Interstate 290, the highway that cuts through Worcester, Murray heard a scraping sound on the roof of his car. You could hear it slide, Murray said of his son in the car seat. I looked to where he should have been. Then in the rearview mirror, I saw him sliding down the highway. I was coming over Route 90 south about noon, said James Booth Bay, 67, a retired antique dealer. I saw something in the air. I thought it was a garbage, something somebody had just tossed out. Then I thought it was a doll. Then I saw the doll open its mouth. I couldn't believe it. It was a little baby. With his car blocking traffic, Booth Bay got out to investigate. What he found was a baby, uninjured, in a car seat, undamaged. I picked the little fellow up, and he looked all around, Booth Bay said. When he started crying, I knew everything was all right. He looked at me as if to say, who are you? He knew I wasn't daddy or mama. That's when he started to cry. When Michael Murray reached Booth Bay, he snatched up his son, telling him, when the police showed up, tell them I went to the hospital. He was a very happy kid, all smiles, State Trooper Mario Tovar, who charged the father with driving to endanger, said of Matthew at the hospital. The doctor gave him a good bill of health. He's a miracle baby. What a Mother's Day gift. The result was one in a million. Michael Murray noted, the doctor said that with the shape of the car seat, it actually flew like an airplane. Murray's car is a hatchback, and its shape may have helped put Matthew into a glide path. We're definitely writing to the car seat company, said Deanna Murray. The seat was identified as Jerry Guard with Glide, said a grateful Deanna Murray. The Jerry Glider, it certainly lived up to its name. So that is the story that was in the newspaper. To follow the story that I shared with you, I thought rather than you going to investigate, you can just hear it on here. But if you want to, you can just look that up on the Internet. So that was some story. Can you imagine? I don't know if any of you have ever been on Interstate uh, Highway 290 in Worcester area. But it's a very busy highway. So that was a true miracle. So I hope you enjoyed that story. It gives me goosebumps when I think about it. My goodness, God was watching over that little baby, wasn't he? Moving on, I'd now like to share the story with you, uh, authored by Holly Baxley, that I told you about earlier, and it's called Paying It Forward. I love this story. It just gives me goosebumps, too. I hope you do. Lying in the sunny patch of light, that filtered through the canopy of live oak branches overhead. He responded in a furry white semicircle, with one pink paw in the air. His eyes were closed, and his upturned face seemed to wrinkle back in a smile, revealing two sharp little canine teeth. The only movement besides the occasional puff of wind that wafted through the leaves, causing the little sunlight patch to dance and move, was one ear that twitched from the tickling breeze. He seemed to own the porch he was lying on, looking for all practical purposes as if he didn't have a care in the world. There was one problem, though. It wasn't his porch, nor his patch of sunlight, not even his live oak tree. But I doubted I could tell him that. As I quietly started up the sidewalk to my house, while wondering how this peaceful puffball ended up at my home, my next-door neighbor hollered out, He's a pretty one, ain't he? Startled by the voice breaking the silence, both the cat and I looked up in the direction of the voice. I smiled back at my neighbor, and I agreed. Yes, he is beautiful. Where did he come from? Can't say. Just showed up this morning. I named him Snowball. I looked back at the still reclining cat, who was staring at me with beautiful, warm blue eyes. He was very beautiful. He shook his head to get the remaining tickle out of his ears. 
stretched all four legs as far as they could go, and then reclined back into a heap on the porch. I sighed. My husband and I had no pets of our own yet, and that was by choice. We were a young married couple in college with hardly any finances of our own to keep ourselves fed. We lived off of Roman noodles and a five-pound sack of mixed beans my sister had given us as a housewarming present when we moved to our off-campus housing. We had no way of affording any kind of pet food, we had told ourselves, so a pet was out of the question. And yet, his little ribs could be seen underneath his thin coat of fur. He probably would not be picky, I reasoned in my head, but I seriously doubted that this cat would enjoy a dinner of Roman noodles, even the ones with chicken flavoring. My neighbor spoke, as if reading my thoughts. He really enjoyed the leftover pieces I gave him from skinning my latest catfish. I caught a beauty this morning from my troll lines. Are you going to keep him? I asked hopefully. My neighbor looked at the cat fondly. I don't think he's really the keeping kind, if you ask me. I think he likes his freedom, but I'm sure between us we can keep him fed. And that's how Snowball came to own us on our little street of Avenue D. He spent his mornings at our neighbor's house enjoying whatever the catch of the day happened to be, and my neighbor was an avid fisherman who went out in the wee hours of the morning to fish. And then if he caught something, he'd bring it back and then string it up in his backyard to fillet. Snowball was at that time ready, waiting in the backyard before our neighbor got home, staring up at the hooks as he knew a fat fish would soon be swinging on. Then after his fishy breakfast, he'd slink silently off on whatever the day held for him, returning in the late afternoon. I'd get back from my classes to find him chasing the patch of soft sunlight on the porch, laying squarely in the center, soaking it all up in the sweet warmth, the only snowball to absorb heat and not melt. My husband and I managed to finagle our finances just enough to add a small bag of cat food to our grocery bill and fed him as he needed, if our fishing friend's lures were empty on that day. The arrangement worked out quite well. Snowbell seemed to enjoy it most of all. He wasn't pressured to be owned. We weren't pressured to own him. And somehow, through the process, we became closer to our neighbors as well. But one day, Snowball needed an owner more than he needed freedom. We woke up one morning to find a very sick Snowball on our porch. It was unusual enough to find him laying on the porch in the morning, but things were far worse than that. He had been in a fight, a very, very bad fight. His left ear was almost torn off and he was bleeding quite profusely. Our neighbors were gone, and time was of the essence. Brent quickly picked up the almost limp kitty and laid him in the, his usual semicircle in his arms. Snowball didn't move, but he did purr. Brent transferred Snowball into my arms and deftly cleaned his wounds and then wrapped his little head in an ace bandage we thought he would struggle against it, but it seems as if he had no fight left in him, and that scared us. We took turns holding him and talking to him from the evening till late at night. We created a little bed for him beside our dryer on our enclosed back porch and put out some food and water. Snowball lay exactly where we put him and made no effort to move. We went to bed that night wondering if we did all that we could. The next morning we peeked out of the kitchen door. Snowball was standing over his water dish trying to lap water the best he could from the restrictive bandage that was around his head. And then we heard him growl as he tried to paw at the wound by his ear. That made us grin, for we knew it was a good sign to see him a little put out by his circumstances. As Brent and I got ready to leave for our respective classes, we noticed our neighbor had his latest catfish conquest on the line out back, but it didn't matter, as he was walking around his yard looking for his little bite for a pal. Brett told him what had happened and pointed at our back porch. Mr. Stanley said that Snowball was lucky to have someone watch over his nine lives and promised to save some fish for him. In the afternoon, he was lying once again on the sunny patch of light, 
this time on top of the dryer. But as soon as he saw us peeking at him through the back door's window, he started meowing loudly and fighting his bandage. We opened the door, and he came streaking through the kitchen. His normally white, skinny tail was as thick as a bottle brush, held rigidly straight up in the air, not as a white flag of surrender, but as a banner raised declaring war. He howled, he yawled, he growled, and while running through every room of our small rent house, every once in a while he'd stop to fight the anonymous bandage that seemed bent on breaking his will. Like a prize fighter using a light footwork while dancing around the ring, Snowball would stand on his hindquarters, weaving and bobbing and clawing at the dressing. He would not yield to the manage, power over him, nor would he stop his crusade to get rid of it himself, of this evil thing. He would fight to the bitter end, until he heard the can opener. Upon hearing the medical whir, he stopped his one cat campaign, seized his claws and padded back to the kitchen, dragging half of the bandage behind him. A victory dinner of tuna and milk awaited him. I figured he had worked too hard to sell for Roman noodles with chicken flavoring. When he had a full tummy, he became much more docile. Brent picked him up once again and medicated his ear and applied a fresh bandage, much to Snowball's chagrin. But if he had been put out with us, he was just as quick to forgive, for the evening found him lying in that familiar semicircle re repose on the couch between Brent and me as we studied. His eyes were closed and he was purring. And that was the moment, the magical moment, that something happened deep in my heart. I fell in love with him. He had weaved and bobbed his way into my heart with his bravery and his courage, and I found myself wanting more than just a casual acquaintance with him. I truly wanted to be his owner. I put down my pen and scratched him under his chin, the only place the bandage didn't restrict him. His purr got louder and deeper. Fish might get hooked on my neighbor's line, but Snowball had me hooked with that loud, precious purr. All of a sudden, Snowball looked up at me, his eyes peering into mine. He winked as if he knew some great secret. I think he personally could see how much I wanted him to become a permanent part of our family. He leaned his head further into my hand to be scratched for a mere minute, and then just as quickly as he leaped down and made his way through the kitchen to the back porch and his little bed. I thought it was rather abrupt, but then I was still learning his ways, having owned dogs for most of my life. I didn't know how a cat acted or responded, and to this day I can't tell you why he did things the way he did. But I've thought about it a lot since then. Perhaps he went to bed that night, so soon because he was worn out from his battle with the bandage. Perhaps he was just ready to be alone for the night. But I honestly think that getting cozy with us was too much for his freedom-loving heart, and he didn't want to get too close to someone who wanted to own him. The next few days, he'd repeat the above antics in a much smaller version. Every day after class, we let him out. He'd run like a crazed cat for a bit, then he'd eat his food, let us undress and redress his wound. But when it came time for Brent and me to study, instead of hanging out with us, he'd head back to the back porch, and then he'd meow to be let out. The first night he did that, we just ignored his cries, because he was too bandaged up to be let out. But the next night his cries got louder and a little bit angrier, so Brent took pity on him and let him outside. I was so afraid we'd never see him again, but in the morning, he was back in his bed, sleeping soundly. He must have been up all night. The next evening, he was let out again, and when we woke up, he was happily eating fish next door. We caught him and took off his bandage for the last time, as his ear was healing nicely. After school, he was once again looking like the old snowball curled up on our front porch in his patch of sunlight. That evening, he came inside, ate some cat food, and hung out with us. He kept staring at me with some kind of far-off look that I could not read. It was as if he was trying to see through me or make up his mind about who I was as a person. I swear to you, 
I've never been so scrutinized before as I was by this cat. I couldn't study because I could feel him staring at me. He cried to be let outside. I watched him saunter out the door and wander off into the night. I didn't know if we'd never see him again. The next morning we looked for him at our neighbor's, but he wasn't there. Brent went to the back porch to see if he was sleeping in his bed. And that's when I heard Brent call out, Holly, come quick, you've got to see this. I ran to the porch, wondering if Snowball had gotten into a worse fight. But what I found amazed me as well. There in Snowball's bed was the tiniest lawn-furred orange kitten, whose eyes were barely open. This baby was too tiny to have been weaned from its mama. And there's no way he could have made his way all the way up himself, even up our back porch steps, let alone into Snowball's bed. His baby blue eyes peeked at Brent and me, and his tiny mouth opened as if to meow, but no sound came out. Not even a tiny squeak. Brent and I stared at each other in wonder as we tried to connect the dots of how this very thin and tiny precious kitten came to us. Later that evening, when there was no snowball to be seen, we did our best to make our new baby welcome in our home. And then Brent said, I know what happened. Snowball didn't want to be owned. He knew we wanted to own a pet. He also knew we took care of him when he was sick. So he found this kitten that needed both a home and a way to be taken care of. I think he decided to help this kitten out the way he had been helped. We sat there stroking this new kitty and marveled at the snowball's thoughtfulness and sense of fraternity. Many years later, I heard the term, pay it forward, which meant that when a stranger provided a random act of kindness, do a random act of kindness for someone else. Snowball was ahead of the curve. He knew how to pay it forward, long before the term was ever coined, and I've been learning that lesson ever since. Wasn't that a beautiful story? It really touched my heart, and I'm sure all of you animal lovers out there enjoyed it too. Animals are so very precious, and God does speak to us through his precious angels, the animals. Again, I want to give a special thanks out to our authors, David Jeremiah, for the story Incredible in the Boston Globe. Thank you so much. And to Holly Baxley for her beautiful story of paying it forward. And to you, my listeners, thank you for joining us today. I hope that you'll have a beautiful week, a beautiful rest of the month. And I look forward to being with you next month when we'll share some more stories. And until that time, stay well, take care, and may God bless. This is Natalie Silver with Life Treasures and Golden Moments.